going into this one was a little strange for me. Those of you who know me uh, know that I don't really retain games that I played for Rumination past tense under the system we used to do, which was uh, the cramming method, right? <clears throat> you, know, you smash through a game as quickly as possible, and then you, you'd finish the test, Rumination, and then you forget about it, right? This is one of the reasons why several games I have streamed recently I've had no distinct memory of, even though I've actually played them before for Ruminations. Uh, as I was going through this one, I did remember bits and pieces as I was going. And in fact, if you were there for the stream, you'll notice the first thing I mentioned was, Is that Jin? You know, right at the beginning, because he's in like the second cutscene. But I mention all that because I feel like this game would work acceptably if you haven't played Xenoblade 2, like if you haven't played the base game. But you really need to have played the base game to appreciate this. It is clearly meant to be done after the base game, which is interesting for a prequel, but here we are. I've also... I wasn't able to verify this, so take this one with a grain of salt, but I have heard from some sources, asterisk, that this was kind of a rush job. Like, they didn't really... they didn't really plan to do this, and they didn't really have this mapped out, but because they have so much of the overall arc of the Xenoblades kind of designed and kind of ready to go, and, you know, the, the way that they kind of tie together, it makes sense that they would be like, okay, well, we have a vague idea of where to go. But it would explain why this game feels disjointed as hell. <laughs> now, I don't want to come off as cr across as too negative, because that's not the point. It's more like... Uh, it's more like a yo-yo. Every now and again, it's really good. And then it's really crap. And that's really good, and crap, and good, crap, good, crap, good, crap. The... Side quests are awful, but then they're good. And the combat is great, but then, like, the... the well, and the, the alternate leveling is great, but then the, the... The the voice acting is acceptable and good in some places, but then the voice directing is terrible. But then the side quests are enjoyable, but then they're mandatory. And the interface is terrible, but the HUD is good. And just... Uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I should have written down more examples of this down here. I'm looking down at my notes here. It's just this back-and-forth thing. Anybody who's actually seen the final score for this game could verify what I'm talking about, because we we rated this game just all over the place. It's I think it was like a zero to story and a plus three to gameplay. And you might think, oh my god, zero, that's terrible. Well, if you know my system, zero's neutral. It's negatives and positives. So if it was negative something, that would be bad. If it was positive, that would be good. If it's zero, it's just... And that's because there were seven positives and seven negatives to story, because it just does this. One of the best scenes in the entire game was during the ending uh, with with, Mar uh, with Martha. Wow. <laughs> with Mithra and uh, the kid, the poor child, and her freaking out over his death. Oh, yeah, spoilers, by the way. And... Then it was almost immediately followed by one of the worst scenes in the entire game, which is when Gort just suddenly comes back out of absolutely nowhere. For no reason. To, to be a final boss that you can't lose, by the way. Because apparently this is FF10 all of a sudden. Just, I, what? <laughs> I don't... I don't know what to make of this game. Let's talk about the gameplay. So, I really like the combat a lot. This is probably, in my opinion, the best combat of the entire franchise. Counting Gears and the Sagas. Yeah. <coughs> Damn it, come on, throat. I know I'm not supposed to count the Gears and the Sagas, because they're not really part of the Zena Saga. Because, you know, rights and everything's all over the place. But, seriously, I really enjoy the combat. The... It has a build-spend kind of a system, which if you play just about any Blizzard game, you know what that is. But for those of you who have, aren't familiar with it, you use abilities, they generate a resource, and then you spend that resource. Now, in this case, it's more like what you're doing is you use auto-attacks, which in, which bring down the, the, the cooldown, so to speak, or, or, or increase the usability, or however you want to think of that, of your actual specials. So, attack, 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 special, attack, 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 special. The thing that really makes this shine, though, is white, uh, white damage, your auto attacks, increase all of the specials equally. So, of your three specials here, all three of them are counting up. 
So it's not like one of the problems a lot of build spend systems have is you have multiple builders, multiple spenders, but one resource, like to use World of Warcraft as an example, rage, right? You have rage. Now, that's not really a problem depending on how you design it, but a lot of games don't design that well and basically hinder the player's progress by making something, you know, boiling it down to two button presses, the best builder and the best spender which WoW does not do, but I can think of several other games that do have that problem. This game does bypasses that problem entirely by making it so that the three generate separately. So you can use the top one here, but the, the bottom two, their bars, so to speak, don't empty. They're still filling. And each given special takes a certain amount of auto attacks, and all of them are, well, most of them are separate from each other in how many auto attacks it takes to fill, which means you have a nice stagger of ability usage. The player is doing more. You know, there's more yellow damage, which I'm always in favor of when it comes to game design. Then we have the fact that that also builds up the swapping thing over here, so you can swap between people. Cool. And when you swap, the person you swap in, all their specials are ready to go immediately, which is which informs a gameplay style at that point, because you want to swap as quickly as you can to immediately do this, or maybe you want to hold off to do a certain attack, because some attacks do things like knockdown, or, uh, let's see, what it's, it's knockdown... Um, Topple, I think, was one of them. And then one is Launch, and I think one is Smash, and I feel like I'm missing one there. But the point being, what you want to do at any given moment is always going to be a bit of a tactical choice because of the nature of how they built the system. This is ignoring the, the combo things and the alternating uh, elemental thing you can do and the fact that you can change it. There's... I'm failing at describing this because it's actually... It's really intuitive and smooth, but describing it would probably take me a while. There's a reason the tutorial just hand walks you through it for like 10 minutes. It's like, okay, here's the system, guys. Because it is a complex system, but not a convoluted system. There's complexity and an actual depth to it. In other words, the exact opposite of Dragon Age 2 Syndrome, which is funny, because that's not the first time I'm going to compare this game to The Last of Us 2. <laughs> Anyways... So, combat, great. Loved the combat. There's also an auto battle. There's a the set the AI on system, which I wouldn't highly recommend unless you're just bored with it or just roaming around farming or whatever. But it's surprisingly good. Now, that's impressive because if you're paying attention, the combat is complex. I've seen RPGs that don't know how to get auto battle properly for, you know, full turn-based, never mind real-time. And where your options are use an ability or attack or, or, or use an item. And they can't seem to figure out how to make an AI script work for that. What would really make this even better is if there was a full set of you know, gambits, effectively, in order to customize it. You know, like in Dragon Age Origins or in Final Fantasy XII. That would be awesome. But as is, it's still a good, uh, it's still a good system. Then you run around and you gather stuff. Uh, gathering stuff is irritating, but rewarding. We're getting more of that bipolar thing going on here. You know, you get plenty of stuff, and there's plenty of good things and buffs and items and, and quests you can do, and the quests themselves give you more recipes and more attributes, and you can raise the things. And, oh, God, the leveling systems in this game. So there's experience, which you just get by, you know, killing and doing. You can also get bonus experience, bonus experience by doing a full-on chain, and that you can get into the six-digit or seven-digit range if you know what you're doing, which I did. I only got into the seven-digit range once. I was actually off camera while I was doing side quests, unfortunately. But still, it was just like, damn. The thing had died at like the, the, the 50,000 range. And I was like, nah, just, just, just keep racking up the damage. Um, and it is really, really broken if you know what you're doing. Takoya in chat brought up a valid complaint here. If you don't know what you're doing, you're screwed. Because the game is designed well enough that the combat really rewards you for doing it properly. But as a consequence, you are severely punished if you don't. It's, it's, it's probably the closest thing to a niggle I could mention there. But I mentioned uh, side quests and gathering. I mentioned why the gathering is irritating. Like I said, it's very rewarding. But let me explain by saying this. I, I tend to not like what I usually refer to as combat spam. In this case, it was actually gathering spam. Every single time you loot a gathering node, there's a voice clip that plays. And there's like two or three per type of gathering. And it gets old. And you do a lot of gathering in this game. And there's irritants like that uh, all over the place. And I do mean all over the place. This actually applies to combat as well. 
there's a lot of visual noise when you're fighting. I actually got to the point very early on where I just was completely ignoring whatever was going on at the middle of the screen. Utterly ignoring it. I was paying attention to my chains, to the boss, and to the, uh, to the boss health, and to the, the, the buffs and the buff timers. I was paying attention to where I was at with the... Uh, w actually, I guess that was only in the one boss fight. So over down here, I was paying attention to where I was at with my current cycles. And over here, I was paying attention to where I was at with my cooldowns and where I was at with my chain level. And the middle of the screen was just noise. Let me tell you a story. Uh, I used to work at retail. I've talked about this a few times. And <laughs> if some of you probably heard me talk about it, I was working at retail when Harry Potter uh, 3 specifically came out. On Thanksgiving, on the day after Thanksgiving, and we had a sale on it. Anyways, while we were uh, while I was working there, uh, I developed a skill which I have to this very day, and this is back in the '90s, so you know I've, I've had this skill for 20 plus years. And that skill is to completely tune out certain types of noise, like the music that plays in a in a retail store. Because you know what I'm talking about if you've ever worked retail or if you even visited. Like most people, they go in and they go out and they just they don't really notice the music that's playing at a restaurant or whatever, unless it's really loud or really obnoxious or it's Christmas. But anybody who's worked there, you don't get the option of just going in and going out. It's not a 20, 30, you know, 10 minute affair. That's eight hours of your life every day. It's just dun da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 and keep doing that for eight hours. So you just tune it out bringing this back into the topic, I started tuning out this game really early on, and I didn't even notice. I was doing it so automatically, someone in chat had to point out, God, the, the noise and the spam in combat's ridiculous, and I, my reaction mentally was, what? What noise? And I forced myself to start paying attention, and then I started like, oh my God, because they're just, they're, it's not just the fact that they're talking at every action. Everyone is constantly talking over each other, and there's the combat sounds, and there's the interface sounds, and there's just... And it just... It just becomes white noise. And it's, this is why I bring this up now, relative to the visual thing, because it's not good. I think it's a stylistic choice, so I shouldn't actually say it's not good, but I don't care for it. It reminds me in many ways of the Tales of series, which tends to have a little bit of, you know, white noise combat thing going on for it, too. Maybe it's supposed to simulate the style of battle? I don't know. I mentioned side quests. Um, so the side quests mostly suck. A lot of them are really irritating to figure out or find, and the quest markers are vague and not super well done. They're not all bad, and that's the point. Some of the side quests are fine. Some of the side quests I needed a walkthrough for. <laughs> um... I mentioned the combat spat, and I mentioned the side quest. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he played through this, and he was like, yeah, I loved it, it was great. And I was like, oh, cool, and we started talking. I shared some of my complaints, and he was like, oh, yeah, I, I played with the game on mute, and I had a walkthrough next to me. And I'm just like, yeah, that tracks. This is definitely a game that's improved by the usage of a walkthrough, because, by the way, the side quests are mandatory. You need to hit level 4 with the community in order to progress through the game. Mandatory. Which I don't think is good. And like I said, about half of the side quests really suck, both in terms of story and in terms of gameplay. I'm going to share with you my least favorite side quest in terms of story. It's the one with Leo and Sarah. Now, for those of you who haven't played this game, Leo is a kid who's trying to impress a girl. That would be Sarah. And uh, as per usual with fiction... She has no real interest in him, but he just keeps persisting, and fiction tends to reward that, which irritates the crap out of me when fiction does that, by the way. It's like, oh, I'm just going to constantly uh, harass and, 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 and uh, uh, I don't want to use abuse, that's the wrong word, um, irritate? You know, pressure you? Like, I can't tell you how many, especially in Hollywood, oh my god, how many movies and shows have that thing where if you just be persistent, you'll get the girl. No. No. Okay. There's a difference between, I kind of like you, but I'm not sure, and please leave, me an please leave me alone, you're irritating me. And Leo crosses over that line like three times, goes off, dies. He's not breathing, by the way. We check to make sure he's not breathing. So we give him a burial. Then we come back, and it turns out he was alive. No explanation given. I remind you that he wasn't breathing. 
And he's come back and he loves her that much. Aww. And she gives him a chance. Isn't it sweet? On the flip side, some of the side quests are great. Well, I'm, again, I, I've picked out one in specific to share with you. There's this kid that's lost, and we go and we find him. It's like, oh, God, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm one of the refugees from one of the nearby villages, which has just been destroyed by Malice's you know, rampages. Thank you for saving me. Uh, have you seen my sister? No, no, we haven't seen Oh, my God, I don't know what I'd do without her. So we go and we find his sister. Okay, there we go. Sometime later, we go to one of the other countries, one of the other Titans. And when we're there, we meet their father who is disconsolate because he hasn't been able to, in, in the chaos of the evacuation and, and the whole, and, and the war-torn situation that's going on right now, he hasn't been able to find either his wife or his children. Now we're like, huh. So we rush back and we have to go through a dungeon because they've been chased and attacked by enemies. But the point is we rescue the kids, again, if you're paying attention, bring them back and return them to him. And he's, oh, thank God, my, my children, you know, my wife is dead, but at least my children are still with me. Thank you so much. That was a good side quest. It was a side quest that showed a nice, down-to-earth, human consequence of the conflict that's currently happening. And it was personally relevant to Adam, who's, uh, let's be honest, he's the main character here. And it had a lot... It, it, it helped kind of build up the sort of the tragedy of the overall thing and, and where this overall story is going because they're probably dead. That was good. Not the death part. That I know that sounds... I'm not evil. Point being, the side quests just bounce back and forth. At first, I was irritated by the side quest structure, too. You know, I was like, well, if you're going to make the side quests mandatory, just make them part of the main quest. But I started thinking about it. There are more side quests than you need to do. You need uh, to hit level four, like I said, which is... I don't know how many people... And not every side quest gives the same amount of people. Some of them are chains and give, like, two or three, in one case, uh, different people for your community. And that's what you actually need, is enough people in the community. And typical for a Xenoblade series. So, if you get to that point, you know, you, you can pick and choose, is what I'm trying to say. You can pick and choose the side quests you do, and you don't have to do all of them. No, the problem I have is the fact that it's freaking mandatory to progress through the game. Although, in fairness, this game would probably be, I'd say, about six hours shorter, if not for that. And that's probably why it's mandatory. I know I keep pushing this, and I know I've talked about this constantly, but it's not the length that matters. It's what you do with it. If the side quests were from this game, as far as mandatory re requirement, what we have left is probably about a 10 to 12 hour game, which is pretty decent in terms of its density. The amount of events and what's happening are all pretty good for that period of time. I'm with it. You know, there's no pad. If you, if you cut out the side quests being mandatory, there's no padding at all. Uh, you see why this bothers me so much? Uh, I want to comment on one other thing really quick, because it's an awesome thing, and that is alternate leveling. So there's these trees uh, for the blades in this one, and the way it works is you go and you do stuff, and that levels them up on the tree. When I say do stuff, I mean kill X monsters, get this many critical attacks, block this many attacks, use this ability, gather this many things, cook this many times, etc., right? You go do stuff. They're basically micro-quests. And each of those micro-quests reward you with stat-ups, effectively. They increase your ability to function. They're a form of alternate leveling that it rewards you specifically doing specific things, micro-quests, rather than just grinding face on whatever gives the most AP or Magicide points or, you know, Sphere points or whatever, right? I keep using Final Fantasy examples. You know what I'm talking about. I like that system a lot. I think a lot of RPGs could be improved by building their talents, because that's effectively what this is, into milestones, microquests, rather than making it just some kind of resource that you build and spend, like, with, like virtually every other JRPG does. It was. Just, I don't have much else to say about it. It's just a fascinating system, and I'd love to use that whenever I take over the world and start actually making video games in my spare time that I'll totally have after having conquered the world. Let's talk about the story. The story, as I mentioned, ended up being a net zero. Um, so the voice acting sucked, except when it was good. The voice direction was pretty much universally bad, in my opinion, because... Because there's some kind of thing they have where they put unnatural pauses in their 
sentences periodically. Now, I can't even do the tone, but the tone was usually completely wrong for what they were saying, too. And it, you could just tell that it was either rushed or the voice director had absolutely no idea what they were doing. No offense, but it sucked. There were some good voice actors in it, the guy who plays Adam, who actually also plays Olgeard over in Witcher 3, and the woman who plays Laura were both you know, standouts as far as actual quality. The animations were bad. We came up with a new term here, so you've heard me talk about empty text before. This game had empty action, where you've probably seen this, especially in a JRPG, where it's probably supposed to be exciting and fluid, but what actually ends up happening is you watch like a second or two of an action, and then the camera shifts, and there's like this, this little pause as it loads the next set of animations, then you see another second and a half of the thing, then the camera shifts again, and it's like, huh? And we see a reaction, and then it shifts again, and then there's another few seconds of an action. It's really stilted. It's the opposite of what I would call good animation and good directing. Maybe that's a stylistic choice? I don't know. But there was a lot of just absence of any energy or flow, or good camera usage, or anything, when it came to the presentation of the action scenes especially. Also, the mo the motion capture and the, the character animations were all canned and not particularly well done, and the lip syncing was terrible. Now, what's everything I just talked about? Someone in the comment section says, nitpicking! No, what I mean by that is that's all presentation. That's all how you present the story to someone. Not the story itself. That's important. I have... Some people have misunderstood this, because to me, story presentation and story are two very different things. Now, in an ideal world, they're merged, and we have both. Red Dead Redemption 2 is my is just the first thing that came to mind. When I think of a good story, that is well presented, right? The, the voice acting, the motion capture, the direction, and the usage, and the storyboarding all serve to amplify and magnify the storytelling, which is good underneath all that. Now, the reason I bring this up is, in my opinion, the core story of Last of Us 2 was not good. But it was extremely well presented. I hate to do that to our comparison, but, I mean, in this case, I think the presentation of this story was total crap, but it was an interesting story. Adam himself is probably the most fascinating character for me to talk about. Uh, hear me out for a second. So, Adam is a prince, but he's way down the list in terms of where he is in line to the throne for, for the kingdom, right? Now, they say that, and then they just kind of leave it at the wayside. But then, we see bits and pieces of that as we go forward, and why that is. See, he's a caring individual. He's basically a JRPG protagonist. You know, I want to help people, friends are my power, etc. He's the kind of person who absolutely would not have a lot of political power, because... The, the far more conniving and manipulative schemers who are out for themselves would do everything in their power to undercut him, right? We see this because he has this dinky province in the middle of nowhere, which is just, just the one little town, and that's basically all that's really under his purview. And he's just kind of in a pseudo-exile. He roams around the countryside constantly, specifically to avoid gathering up what is effectively an uprising. There's a guy who says, oh, thank God, you're finally going to the capital and going to claim the throne. And Adam's like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to visit, dude. Chill. Okay, just, just take a chill pill. But my favorite little tidbit is he doesn't even have a military. When things get bad, there's this little subquest which kind of gets abandoned, but it's there in the background about him forming a militia. Why? Because he doesn't have a military. And when he starts forming the militia, he can't support them. Because he doesn't have the economic or industrial backing necessary to support them. So we have to go around and recruit people, and we have to go around and get resources and supplies for them. Adam is a fascinating character. This is what I mean. I, 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 in, in the review and, and in the stream, I mentioned I like the political intrigue. This is what I'm talking about. The idea of Adam and his presentation within the local nobility is fascinating to me and very, well, very, very, very interesting. Very interesting to me. I love the fact, like, we see uh, the, the evil brother, and he is evil because he looks evil. It's the Fire Emblem rule. 
And he says, ha, 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 I was born with this face, and therefore I must be evil. Um, evil brother, he's kind of bare, right? That's, th that's not really all that politically interesting. He's the schemer who is higher up in the throne and is plotting against us and constantly tries to disparage us and would succeed if not for his older brother, who is actually the king, unnamed, by the way, I looked it up, who is it has a brain and is a decent leader and is probably the only reason that the kingdom is running as well as it is at all. That that's just that's the little additive. That's that's the side dish of potatoes. It's good, but it doesn't compare to the main thing of of the roast beef here. This is just oh, I love this. Um, and then we have uh, Amalthus is the next person I really want to talk about. Amalthus. I don't remember if I said this back in my rumination of Zettelby 2, so allow me to state my opinion now rather clearly. Amalthus is the villain of Xenoblade 2 and Torna. He is the actual core, central, no really villain of Xenoblade 2, my opinion. Which is funny because it's a, it's one of those tragic fall kind of a things. He's not evil in the mwahaha sense he's evil in the, you know, I, I have lost all faith in reality and believe it is literally... Div this, this guy was so pissed off at the world around him that he climbed up into space to demand an answer from God, or what he thought was God, in order to figure out what the heck was going on. Explain this to me, sir. The answer he got was insufficient because of the stuff going on with the architect, which I think I talked about back in the, the two rumination. This guy, we see a lot more of his manipulating and conniving. It's more in the background, but at the same time, it's interesting to see his rise to power and how he put the pieces into place, how the blade eaters and the, the flesh eaters kind of were pushed into the forefront and how little he thought of those around him. And considering Malos here is basically flat out a direct consequence of Amalthus's, uh, yeah, let's just call it that, you know, divine will to end the world. I think, I think that's a good way to put it. He literally says in this game, flat out, it is the divine will for this world to end. So it worked for me. <laughs> he says this to the, the, the evil, conniving, scheming brother. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting to see his presentation. We even see the kid. We don't see him kill a child on camera. But we don't need to, do we? Mithra, so I, I suppose I'll talk about Laura next, because Laura is the main character, but I actually have very little to say about her. I mean, it's not that she's bad, and she's, like I said, she's one of the better voice actresses, it's just that there's not much there for her. She's a mercenary, wandering around. Do, 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 do. Oh no, I've encountered the local prince, Adam, the main character, who's also with Mithra, by the way. And then, da, 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 and then she, like, leaves the main narrative and, you know, goes off and has what happens to her and sin, uh, excuse me, it's in Jin uh, is, is effectively taken from her thanks to Amalthus, blah, 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 blah. I don't disprove of, disapprove of this because the idea here, at least by my interpretation, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as always, my interpretation is they wanted to show the main plot from someone else's perspective. You know, the Tetis thing in Final Fantasy X, to put, ex except a little bit better done. Because this is Mithra's and Adam's story, as told from the perspective of Laura. You know, how we kind of slide into the plot and then slide right back out of it after Torna crashes and we just go off and do our own thing. Now, I'm with that, and it works quite well, except, except for that problem where Gort shows up. It's actually one of the worst scenes of the game where Gort just shows up all of a sudden and talks for way too long. To, to, to say that he's evil, he's evil, he's evil, he's evil, and imagine if I just did this for about eight minutes and you've got the general gist of it. It's just completely over the top, completely misplaced. And then you have a boss fight, which you can't lose, and then the actual ending, which is good, starts. It's just, what? And again, this immediately follows the end of Mithra's arc. Mithra is a very clear example of droid effect. She came out and she didn't care about anyone or anything, and she was just all about efficiency. Then she parties with the group, at a low level. This is why the down-to-earth perspective of this game helps it so much. I, I know I talk about that a lot. I've, I've mentioned this on stream, too. I, I don't mind large scale. I don't mind big stakes. I don't mind, you know, ah, save the world or the galaxy or whatever. But that's the norm. And so that's fine. 
but it makes it so when a story brings the camera down to the ground level, it tends to make that more interesting to me because it's not the norm. Because now we get to see what it's like from the ground perspective. And this is especially important in character for Mithra, who sees the kids that they got back to their dad, or the guy who needed extra food, or the, the, the child who wanted to learn how to, to, to make a better invention, or maybe the, you know, the, the the guy who wanted to figure out what kind of hat to sell, and so forth and so on. Mithra being shoved down to such a low scale and being paired up with Adam was exactly what she needed, because she needed that human element, that, I hate to use this word, intimate contact with people. Imagine if Mithra had only seen the world from a distance. Imagine if she had only seen stats, or, you know, ideas, or she was literally looking through a glass as she watches a nation fight a war. You need that personal element to really de learn and develop things like empathy and sympathy and a personality, to be blunt. This was what Mithra needed, and thus this is why Pyra is the way she is. And this whole game is the development of Pyra. That, that, that is probably the core main plot. You know, we got the political stuff with Adam, we've got the destruction of Torna, and we've got Mithra and why Pyra is the way she is. Pyra's even a good cook, for God's sakes. I liked this game for all its flaws, and I enjoyed going through it. Um, I will also say this game kind of made me go, huh, in how this could be connected to Chronicles X, you know, with the whole... S spoilers for the whole Xenoblade series thing. Just really quick. Just really quick. I, I already gave that warning, but just on the off chance you haven't played the previous uh, three games. Spoilers. The idea that this might be set before Chronicles X is interesting to me, because after the theory that I have, and I, I would love to hear you tell me how stupid and wrong I am, is first we have Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2. Well, actually, first we have Torna, but we have Xenoblade 1 and 2. Where both halves of Claws are doing their thing. And then death. And as a result, the two worlds merge back into the way they should have been from the beginning. This leads to the actual new Earth that, Claw, that, that the architect, this versions of Claws, was actually trying to make to begin with. You know, with the blades and the cycle of life and studying and developing and titans, etc. What if this then becomes that Earth with all that knowledge of, you know, digital life and how to preserve memories and DNA within crystal code mechanism, etc., which then leads to Chronicles X. Not directly, but you can see how it could be set over here. What do you guys think? I'm very curious, because I'd like to see this series continue at this point, especially if it's going to maintain continuity, kind of like we didn't really get with Gears and the Sagas. But that's all I've got for now. I hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you next time, guys.